Good afternoon. This is Patrizia Morgante, the communication officer of the USG. Welcome for the people who are online. Bienvenue à tout le monde. Uh, le web webinar will be in English and French. And what you are seeing right now on the screen is the website, the official website of the Extraordinary Missionary Month that is yesterday Pope Francis celebrated. I am very happy to, to welcome uh, Sister Georgian and uh, Brother Lazar. And thank you for accepting our invitation to share your uh, reflection on mission. Um, this event uh, of the USG is part of all the events that we are planning for the Synod and for these extraordinary missionary months. Um, Pope Francis decided to celebrate the 10th, the 100th anniversary of the encyclical published and written by Benedict XV. Maxim, maximum Illud, that was to reorganize the mission experience. And the lemma that Prof, Pope Francis chosen, chose is baptized and sent. So this is an invitation for all of us actually, right, Georgiana Lazar? So it's for all of us, I'm a lay woman. So, but what we are going to talk today, to reflect today, is how we as religious men and women we live the mission agentes intergentes you will help us to understand the difference today in this war in this moment in our society the other aspect that is very that i want to highlight is the fact that this missionary extraordinary month is within the, another event that is very important for the church that is the synod on Panamazonic region. And the title of the Synod is New Path for the Church. So I wonder if perhaps the Pope is saying to us that from this Synod, we can learn something new about mission and you know, learn, learn something and, learn, and change perhaps our way to be in mission, to be baptized and sent. So thank you again for being here. I would like to start with a short prayer that is within, if you visit the website, if you visit the website uh, in the formation, you have the guide here and it's in different languages, I think at least eight languages and within this book, you will find the prayer, but before, praying the prayer chosen by Pope Francis, I would like to show to you the Pope's video for this month dedicated to the missionary spring in the church. So dedicated to the uh, extraordinary missionary months. Hoy es necesario un nuevo impulso en la actividad misionera de la Iglesia para afrontar el desafío de anunciar a Jesús muerto y resucitado. Llegar a las periferias, a los ambientes humanos, a los ambientes culturales y religiosos todavía ajenos al Evangelio. Y en esto consiste lo que llamamos misio agentes. Y recordar que el corazón de la misión de la Iglesia es la oración. Este mes misionero extraordinario, recemos para que el Espíritu Santo suscite una nueva primavera misionera para todos los bautizados y enviados por la Iglesia de Cristo. We will continue praying the 
prayer together, I'll ask Sister Georgian to read the text. You can also read it in English or French with you, with your community. Heavenly Father, when your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, rose from the dead, he commissioned his followers to go and make disciples of all nations. And you remind us that through our baptism, we are made sharers in the mission of the church. Empower us by the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be courageous and zealous in bearing witness to the gospel so that the mission entrusted to the church, which is still very far from completion, may find new and efficacious expressions that bring life and light to the world. Help us make it possible for all peoples to experience the saving love and mercy of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Jen, for reading. And I'm very happy to introduce our speakers today. Sister Georgian Donovan is a general superior of the Mary's Missionary Sisters. We ask her to share from her charism the experience of our congregation on mission today. Then we will have a Father Lazar Sanislao who is the mission secretary in Rome for his congregation. And we ask him to share the um, challenges of the mission agendas today. So we will give them 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes to share their experience. And then we will have a session for question and answers or comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Good afternoon, everyone, or in some cases, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are tuning in from other parts of the world. It is truly a privilege for me to be invited to participate in this webinar today. The topic is very close to my heart since I am a member of a religious congregation of women that has mission agentes ad extra as one of the core elements of its charism. The other two core elements are that of being Marist and religious. First of all, missionaries today and yesterday share in the same mandate that Jesus gave to his disciples. Go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. This is the mandate to every Christian. We are baptized and as disciples of Jesus, we are sent on mission to proclaim God's saving work. That's what the mission is all about, God's work. We are sent to proclaim the Paschal mystery of Jesus, his Passover from death to new life and the reconciliation that he offers to each one of us. It is a proclamation of joy that through our baptism, we have become partakers in this mystery and that this great gift is open to all. Where we go and to whom we go will depend on the spirit-led vocation of each Christian. Today, I will speak about this in the context of the vocation of the religious and specifically of the missionary religious woman. In reflecting on the theme, I asked myself 
what would be the key elements of Mission Agentes today as different from Mission Agentes yesterday? That is, in former times. I reflected on this through the prism of my own congregation's beginnings and subsequent development to help shed light on the subject. My congregation is rather unusual. It has no foundress or founder. Rather, we have 11 pioneers. The first one being Mary Francoise Periton, a lay woman from Lyon in France. It was she who planted the seeds that would grow into my congregation, the Missionary Sisters of the Society of Mary. Her story, therefore our congregational story, which flows from her story, is unusual. Mary Francoise was a member of the Association of the Propagation of the Faith, a lay association founded in Lyon in 1822 by a laywoman, Pauline Mary Jericho, who is now venerable in the church. Basically, the members of this association worked in small cell groups, no more than 10 in a group, and they collected money for the support of the missions. The 1842 Annals of the Association published a letter written to the faithful in Lyon from the Christians of the island of Uvea in the Pacific. In the letter, they stated, we have already had practical proof of your charity, but now we are making still another request. It is that if you hold us dear, that is, if you love us, you send us some devout women, some sisters, to teach the women of Uvea. The Christian faith had not been planted for very many years before the this letter had been sent to Leon, and the signatures on the letter were two young women who many years later would become religious themselves. This message deeply touched the heart of Mary Francoise Periton, and she experienced it as a personal appeal. She heard the cries of these women as something that was meant for her. She prayed, she took advice, we would call that discernment today, and it was a long discernment. It was over three years before the decision matured in her. And she could finally say, I have given the matter much thought, and my decision is final. My firm wish is to serve on the mission fields for the rest of my life. So, at the age of 49, which was not young in the mid 1800s, she was well past middle age, she set out. Before leaving Lyon, she accompanied the provincial of the Society of Mary, the Marist, to the shrine of Fouvier. And he added her name to those of the Marist missionaries in the heart that hung around the neck of the statue of Mary. It was a symbolic gesture that she never forgot because for her, it was the assurance that she had been confided to the Society of Mary. And here we have the indication of the second core element of our charism, that of being Maris, being part of Mary's own family. Mary Francoise set out in faith with no backing, no support, behind her and with no resources to take with her. She didn't even have enough money to pay for the journey. So she worked to pay her fare. She trusted in divine providence to provide for all her needs. And she knew and believed that providence would take care of her once she arrived in the islands. She left France in November of 1845 and in October 1846, she finally arrived on the island of Uvea 
which is also known as Wallace in the Pacific. This was part of the mission territory of Western Oceania that had been entrusted by the church to the Society of Mary in 1836. It was the practice of the church at that time to entrust to congregations of men, I am presuming it was men, certain territories in different parts of the world to carry out the work of evangelization. It was the men, the priest, who were considered to be the missionaries. Our sisters were considered their auxiliaries. Mission in those terms had a geographical context. There were the mission countries and the mission sending countries. Mary Francoise lived with solitude as her constant companion for 12 years on the islands of Wallace and Futuna, responding to the needs of the women and children. In 1858, her desire that others would join her was fulfilled when three Sisters of Charity of the Third Order of Mary, as they were called, arrived in Futuna. The following day, she took a vow of obedience to the bishop. She received the rule and the habit, and she was a Sister of Charity of the Third Order of Mary. Over the next two years, seven others arrived in Oceania. These, our 11 pioneers, were missioned to various islands in different vicariates entrusted to the Society of Mary. They took a vow of obedience to the bishop and they lived according to a simple rule of life. In that, there is the indication of the seed of the third dimension of our charism, that of being religious, consecrated religious. It took 85 years and many different stages of growth and development before we were approbated as a congregation of pontifical right in 1931. During those 85 years, our locus of mission was Oceania. Women from, from many countries joined the congregation, but all of them set out for mission in Oceania. And in the early years, they set out with the understanding that they were going for life. It was a total giving of self, leaving behind beloved families, nations, the comfort of cultures and customs in order to give themselves away in love for Christ and the people to whom they were sent. Also, women from the islands of Oceania joined our congregation from the beginning, and they too were often sent on mission to other islands. So the call to mission ad gentes ad extra was for us an integral part of our charism and remains so today. With the approbation of 1931, our congregation was open to universal mission. We were no longer restricted to mission in Oceania or to the territories associated with the missions of the Society of Mary. From that time on, we were able to respond to the invitations to serve in mission in different parts of the world, and we went, especially to those on the margins, to those on the peripheries. In the past, the term gentes referred to the heathens or the pagans which is not exactly a positive expression today. This understanding promoted the idea that missionary endeavor meant going to the other with the intention of converting everyone to our faith. It also led to the thinking, I think especially among the priest, that we could look for or measure success by the number of baptisms or the total embrace by the people of our way of perceiving the world and living in it. Since Vatican II, there has been a radical shift and transformation in the church's understanding of the gentes. We see the shift clearly in the Vatican II document, Nostra Etate, and I quote, the Catholic church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions. It has a high regard for the manner of life and conduct, the precepts and doctrines, which although differing in many ways from its own teaching, 
nevertheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all men and women. It was article number two. This openness to the other laid the groundwork for further development in missiology, which promoted a new understanding of Christian mission, an understanding of which I was formed to become a missionary sister after Vatican II. For me, key elements of mission agentes today are that we participate in Missio Dei. The mission is God's mission, not ours. It's not the churches, it's not my congregation, it's not individuals. It is Missio Dei. It is Trinitarian in essence. It comes from the impulse of the dialogue of God. God who saw the world in need and decided to send his son to fulfill the saving work of God's plan in the power of the spirit. God sent Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit to effect the mission. All disciples of Jesus are called to participate in the mission of Jesus by working for peace, justice, and the fostering of right relationships in our world, thus striving to build the reign of God, to step out of their comfort zone, to reach out to the other wherever the spirit urges. Another key element is that missionaries participate in this mission in a culture other than their own, be that culture in one's own country or in another country, with and among a people to whom they have been sent and hopefully invited with the awareness that, A, we walk on holy ground where the spirit has already preceded us. B, we open ourselves to receive from the richness of the other, as well as to share, when invited, the richness of our own faith tradition, and to give ourselves in service in the name of Jesus. C, living the mission of Jesus faithfully with love and respect for all creates the possibility for mutual evangelization. The missionary is evangelized by those with whom they live, by those to whom they are sent. D, we learn from and collaborate with, it is the cum gentibus, with those who have welcomed us into their midst to share in the works of justice and peace. E, we help to build the bridges with which to cross the multi-layered divides that pit people against each other, causing serious brokenness in society. Thus, we become ambassadors of reconciliation. F, what will be required of us is a gradual self-emptying, a daily dying to self, so as to put on the mind of Christ, discovering his way of being the first evangelizer. An early Marist missionary once said that it was easy to leave his own country. It was much harder to leave his self every day. And the last key, the last point under this key is this will empower, it empowers and impels us to act justly, to love tenderly, and to walk humbly with our God and with our brothers and sisters. Although the Second Vatican Council ushered in a new understanding of mission agentes, I believe that we are still in the process of conversion and transformation in its practical applications today. In reviewing my own constitutions and our text on mission, that express the core of our charism, I ask myself, how well do we live the ideal that is presented for us? What do they call me to live into today? I would like to share a few of these texts with you from my constitutions, which were written 35 years ago, not yesterday. 
and I believe we still need to embrace them. The following excerpts are taken from a chapter entitled At the Service of Evangelization, which for me indicates a basic underlying attitude of the missionary, to be at the service of. In our text, Maris Missionary Sisters are reminded that mission is the work of God. The loving plan of the Father revealed by the Son is continued in the church through the power of the Spirit. Always at work leading humanity in Christ to the Father. God sent Jesus to do God's mission. Jesus is the first evangelizer. We participate in the mission of Jesus. In complete availability, we are ready to leave our own country, to set out or set out again towards other peoples, other cultures, knowing that the spirit precedes us. We go with respect and openness to mutual evangelization. And I quote, sent to those who do not know Christ those who are seeking to know him or to local churches in need of missionary service, we open ourselves to their way of life, ready to receive as well as to give, having no other aim than to seek humbly with all the coming of the kingdom in its fullness. We do mission in the name of Jesus in a spirit of collaboration. In different services chosen in the light of our tradition, according to the needs of the country and the priorities of the local church, we keep in mind that in the light of faith, it is Jesus himself we serve in each person, especially in the little ones, the suffering and the poor. We are inspired by Mary's attitudes as Marist, it is Mary who inspires our way of being at the service of evangelization. In Cana, she went to the wedding as a guest, not as the host. She saw the needs and very discreetly, she responded. Confident in her help, we seek to serve like her, humbly and discreetly without imposing. And I think this is very important for the missionary, without imposing so as not to impede God's action in those we serve. We prepare or encourage others to take their own responsibilities. When we are no longer needed, we are free to leave in order to respond to the new needs of mission today, to the new calls of the people crying, if you love us, you would come. Among other peoples and in our own country, in respect and dialogue, we try to be bonds of communion between peoples, races, and cultures, and witnesses to universal love. From the very beginning, our sisters lived in multicultural communities. Today, we like to think that we are striving to become truly intercultural communities, where we witness to the truth that with faith, it is possible to share life in communion with respect for all, welcome to be changed and transformed by the richness of the other, even the others in our own communities. It is possible to live in such communities and the witness that we give of this to the world, I think is needed more than ever before. More and more people are afraid of the other. We must witness something else. Hopefully, all of us, you and I, can rediscover our missionary call to be guests of the other, to walk gently with respect among the other, to be open to mutual evangelization, and when the time is right, to welcome others to our home as honored guests. Today, as missionary women, we know that the heart of mission is prayer. We are sent out each day from a community based on prayer and the Eucharist. We return from missionary service to be refreshed and nurtured once again in prayer. Without this, we cannot be missionaries in today's world. 
We listen to the cries of the poor today. We try to respond to the new needs, the needs of women who are trafficked, the needs of street children, the needs of refugees and immigrants. At case in point, we often collaborate in such ministries because we are very conscious of our poverty of resources and personnel. So we try as best we can to partner with others, to engage with others who have the experience of doing this. And right now we have a sister in Sicily who is working with UISG, living in an inter-congregational community, reaching out to the refugees. We have worked with JRS and other services, service groups that give support to refugees in times of war. And this to me is more and more the way that the missionary effort today can be proclaimed in collaboration with others. There's much more I could say, but I know that there's more to be heard from the wisdom of Lazar. And I hope that we can stir up some conversation about mission today. But I believe today there are new attitudes needed. There is a new way of approach. And hopefully we will listen to the spirit guiding us and impelling us to go out to the peripheries. Where are the cries of the poor? If you love us, you would come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgian, for your profound reflection, starting from your own charismatic experience. I just want to echo a couple of things. It seems that now mission can be just a mission in partnership, in dialogue, but not only within our church, but also with other partners outside our faith, our uh, values in a way. We have to be able to talk with everyone. So I'm, I think this is the strong message from Pope Francis. And it's true that the mission is changing, but it's also true that the core of the mission is this openness to the other. Far, close, and within the other, we have to consider also the cosmo, the rest of, you know, of the lives that are not human. This is the message from the Synod. So thank you very much. So your congregation is a congregation of women for women. Yeah. Inspired by a woman. Inspired by women, yes. Inspired by women, for women. We don't neglect the men but we have a special love for and care for women and children. Yeah. Thank you. So now we are very happy to enrich our reflection on mission, the reflection of Father Lazar, on the challenges I see on your presentation, ad inter gentes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia, for inviting me to present uh, this particular session on mission agendas, especially on challenges. Therefore, I would like to mainly special mention about this particular aspect of challenges. Now, the first is, I would like to just to stress today, it is a missio ad and intergentus. Because today it is not only mission ad gentis, today acknowledging ad gentis, but going beyond this. Therefore, working with and among and between religions and cultures. Therefore, it is more of what we call today is Missio intergentis, with people, among people, among religions and cultures and nations. Therefore, here we see mainly the actualizing the spirit's presence in them and recognizing God's presence. 
I mean, sister was talking about this, how we could recognize God's presence also in the other religions and cultures. Now, as, as we see, I have just two, 10 points to present. I hope I can finish within the given time. Uh, 10 challenges. These are the challenges I feel which are important for today, of course, uh, depending upon these situations, we can also add more challenges. The first one is, we call it cultural orientation. Today to be agentes or intergentes, today we need to learn the culture. Without learning the culture of another, another country, another place, another peoples, we cannot really work among people and with the people. Learning the culture involves, especially learning the language. Without knowing the language, we just cannot be a missionary in another place, in another, another, another situations. So that involves a kind of entering into the process of interculturation. We were talking about what we call inculturation. In today's understanding, we need to go one step further entering into the process of interculturation. That is a really a challenging thing. It is not easy, I'm, I know very well, from our own experiences, uh, from different, different places, different countries, but then we have to slowly enter into this process. If any congregations, I would like to talk generally and also from our own congregation, any congregations, going agentes intergentes mission we need cultural learning first in our congregations first we always give them time to learn the language six months one years two years some places even three years we give them to learn the language because it is so important to be so effective in our missions the second one is identification with the poor. Sister also talked about how a missionaries as their congregation went and worked among the poor. Certainly for any congregations today, I would call a important challenge to identify with the poor. Therefore, a challenge to enter into the culture of poverty. Now, the culture of poverty term is uh, something which we can discuss further. Uh, this is not the time for me to explain the whole aspect of it, but it, there is a challenge. We have to look at this aspect positively, the contentment aspect of it, the prayerfulness aspect of it, the way the, the people try to be, become happy even though they are poor. So that there are many positive elements of culture of poverty. Therefore, we see as a challenge, the poor evangelizes and we evangelize the poor. When Pope Francis yesterday talked about go to all the nations, what is important is all the nations to preach the word of God, all, he stressed all peoples. So when we really stress that aspect, we also see how they evangelize us. It is not only we evangelize them. In that aspect, a very important challenge is how to enter into the pathos of the poor. Pathos, meaning suffering. To enter into the suffering is something is very, very challenging. It is not that easy. Some people who have not really suffered at all, who have not had any pain, it's very difficult to understand the pain of the others. Once in one of our institutes where we were training the conferers, sisters and uh, the missionaries to go to another country, a person got sick and he told me first time he is experiencing the pain of being sick. He said he was never sick. So, you know, unless we become sick and we enter into the pain of others, it's very difficult also to understand the pain of the others where we are going to work. This particular photo, which is in the slide, is a very iconic photo. Many people have seen it earlier. 
But I'm giving this particular photo because the person who had taken this particular photo was a young person, a young journalist. But after taking the photo, you could not sleep for nights. It simply suffocated him. After a few days, he committed suicide. He just too could not understand this suffering. Therefore, as a missionary, it is important to enter into the suffering to see what the suffering means and how to respond to this suffering. It's important is how to respond. Probably the young person did not know how to respond. Now, the next one is what he called fundamentalism and witness. This particular picture, what you see there in the slide, is from Sri Lanka. After the terrorist attack, the funeral ceremony is taking place. Therefore, to understand the fundamentalism today, when we go to another country, to another place, other peoples and nations, today fundamentalism is very strong. In India, Indonesia, you go to, we go to African countries, fundamentalism is very, very strong. So it is not easy. We can say we are Argentine missionaries, we go out, we preach, but then there are strong elements of fundamentalism. Then there is also element of terrorism. Therefore, what happens? There is a hatred and division among the people, and there is a mindless violence. But this creates a fear, a fear among the missionaries to go out, how much time we have to be in, where to go, how to go, how to, how to deal with the people, and so forth. Therefore, that fear often cripples. So this is a real challenge, how to be an intergender missionary in a place or in a country where there is a fundamentalism and terrorism. So how to be a witness in this context? Uh, that is not easy. Certainly, it needs a lot of courage. Certainly, we need prayer, as Sister emphasized. Then along with that, we need also courage. Therefore, we underline today the boldness of faith and martyrdom. So we need to be really bold. Today's intergender mission, without being bold, it is not easy. It's not, it, 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 it demands something of boldness. Therefore, are there martyrs in our society? I'm sure we have martyrs in our congregations. We can always name them. But how many? But in today's context, are religious as missionaries, are we ready to be martyrs? This is also another challenge, especially in the context of fundamentalism and terrorism. But that calls for your radical living. So the radical living really you know, pushes us, impulses to be a martyr or to live with boldness. Therefore, this is another challenge, I would call it in today's context. In today, intergender mission can be done in many different ways. One of the ways is what we call establishing solidarity. As Patricia informed, we are in the context of uh, Synod on Amazon. I have listened to many of some of the talks in different places. Being solidarity with the tribes, with the indigenous people, uh, that is something which is very, very important. As missionary congregations, how can we really form this solidarity? How do we work in solidarity? Well, solidarity among the people mainly to defend their rights. Because like where the people, people in Amazon or people in Africa or people in different other parts of the world, there are people who are marginalized or sometimes even the immigrants, the refugees. So we need to really understand what is the meaning of their rights. 
So therefore, in different context, it would differ. But certainly, solidarity among the people means to defend their rights, to work for their freedom. Some people or some places, they are so much, what do you call, clapped together, put together, although in their cell or in the prison, uh, without much freedom. Therefore, to work for their freedom. The third one is something maybe controversial. It is a political participation. Today, as missionaries, I know very well that we cannot involve directly in the political participation, but we can always, what do you call, encourage the local people to enter into the political participation so that they can really assert their rights. They can live as human beings. So this is also another element. Therefore, one congregation or two congregations may be difficult to work in different places. So networking with the other agencies, as sister gave an example of Sicily, which is already happening here in Italy, but also maybe in South Sudan, also in many other, other places in Latin America, I'm, I am aware in, in Brazil, also Christian brothers in uh, uh, Arab countries, they are working together so that we are able to really form solidarity and solidarity among the people so they are not scattered, their rights are recognized. Therefore, in this context, especially forming lay groups, forming lay missionaries, also understanding media, and in that context, reaching out to the poor and so forth. So all these things are really connected to understanding solidarity. So as missionaries, that we really need to really ferment this particular aspect of solidarity. Okay, solidarity can be a slogan, but it should not remain as a slogan. We need a kind of a participation. We are aware what is going on in Ecuador now. I just two days back, I heard from some of our missionaries, they also participated in the protest. Yeah, they also participate in the protest. I know as uh, missionaries from foreign countries, uh, it is rather difficult. It is very challenging to protest in another country, certain type of protest. We have to be careful. We have to understand the situations. But all the same, what I would like to underline is that solidarity is important. We would like to understand in this context also solidarity with what you call understanding of Pope Francis and Pope John Paul. They have given very clear understanding, solidarity and compassion. That is understanding of mission. Pope Francis had given the understanding of misery, our people who are suffering, and the mercy which is needed, that also calls for our mission today. Another aspect of a challenge is to be a prophetic role of the church. The religious missionaries to be a prophetic role of the church. We call in Asia, prophets are lived parables in Asia. Their life itself challenges others. Therefore, as missionaries, that we are to be a lived parables. Prophets are not only to protest. It is not only just to protest alone, but also to indicate a change. From my experience, I would say that every congregation needs prophets today. If there are no prophets in your congregation, it is very difficult that particular congregation would really grow. Therefore, for real growth, as well as understanding mission intergentis, Today, we need prophets. But no one can claim that I am your prophet, so listen to me. I need to live the prophetic values. I have to really indicate that particular change through my witness. Then others may call that you are your prophet. Another aspect is recognizing collective energy of the people. Uh, today, people have got a lot of energy. In the intergender mission today, what we need is recognizing the collective energy of the people. 
it can be assimilative and institutionalized. Meaning to say, the energy can be formed as an institution you know, with certain structures and so forth, or it can be assimilated as a form of a movement, or, and then for proper cause you try to work on. This is the photo which I took actually when I visited Papua New Guinea, where one of our conferers working with the people understanding their particular energy. People have a lot of energy. People have a lot of positive energy. And this positive energy can be really channelized. This is one of my visits to Papua New Guinea. Other element is uh, questioning the unjust customs among the people. Missio intergentes, yes, we need to really show the love of God among the people. Missio they, just we heard. But in that particular element, concretely, one of the things is there are many customs which are really dehumanizing when we understand the customs and the cultures. Therefore, first of all, we need to try to understand the tradition that it de dehumanize. Africa, in India, or any other customs, or in Latin America, even in Europe. But if there is any trad traditions which is actually dehumanizing, then we need to really oppose those particular traditions. Customs that oppress the weak, sometimes it is also possible a particular custom that are also oppress the weak persons. Only the weak people, the marginalized people, are to do certain things, and they are not allowed to grow in the ladder, maybe like a caste system in India, or uh, slavery in a particular part of some countries, or even oppressive systems, systems of the poor. Only the rich have got powers, and the others don't have powers, and so forth. So therefore, these particular unjust customs, customs that are many, you know, we can go on narrating many of the customs which are unjust, which need to be challenged. But how to challenge the unjust cultural system? It can be done only together with the people, with a lot of empowerment and so forth. This is one of my visits to Tanzania among the Maasai tribes. There you see a group of people, but it is uh, actually one family and their son there. And this particular father has got three wives and they are living in the same compound. There are three huts there and three wives are living in the three huts. And this is one of the customs, very difficult sometimes to question those traditions. But then as intelligentist missionaries, what we can do? It's a big question to understand the custom, but at the same time, understanding the dignity of women, then we need to really see how to challenge. Intergenders missionaries, we need to be also what you call countercultural. How to form a countercultural community. First of all, we as missionaries at the, they call in inter in the inside the community at the intra we need to be actually countercultural taking the values of the gospels and live and show now these particular cultural traditions are something which are unjust therefore i or we as a community we live this intercultural community with a certain focus with certain values certain orientations but at the same time, we also try to form intercultural communities. That is Monsieur Intergentes. That means it is not as they were living traditionally with certain customs and so forth, but then today we challenge. There we give the values of the gospel, with the values of the gospel and understanding what is mission, what is love, what is transformation, we try to form the communities, what do we call Countercultural communities. Establishing relationship among the people of other religions. Of course, sister talked about it, about what you call understanding other religions. Here only I would like to just 
pinpoint only one of the aspects. We have talked many times about dialogue, but today it's a time to move beyond the dialogue. That means with certain programs. What are the programs do we have? What are the programs do we have especially? For, the, for working among other religions. That's a real challenge to have the programs, projects. It calls for transparency, making a budget together with them and discussing with them, taking decision with them. Therefore, in the religious uh, dialogue is not just on dialogical aspect alone. Today, we need a kind of working, doing something for the transformation. And this is the challenge today in our Monsieur Indergentis. The last point as uh, one of the challenges, I would call it enter into civil society. Today, I, I already said earlier, as missionaries, we cannot enter into political system. We can't enter into political parties and so forth. We are aware of that. But there is a possibility to be involved in the civil society. Okay. Work in the government offices. Work as a nurse in the government hospital, not only in our convent schools not only in our own missionary schools, but also work also in the other civil societies. Can you, there are possibilities to work as a member in the civil society, in the government agencies, or with the others, or with another groups. Maybe sometimes you want to become a mayor of the city, become the member of a municipality. Are there possibilities? I think so, there are possibilities, but that without entering into politics. Here, people have to think, once a person is there, you become like a salt. The missionaries become a salt. It is not because of majority here, but through our witness value, through our entering into the civil society, that we can find possibilities to change question the other members in the civil society. That's why I take it as a big challenge today. I am not advocating this for all the missionaries. It is not for the whole congregation. But we should have a space also for some people so that they may enter into the civil society so that they will work like a salt in the field to bring some challenges. Therefore, as we know that we are to be a missionary church, as Pope Francis always had really indicated, given clear, clear change, that church which goes forth to the periphery, and we can become an effective missionaries when we have this mission-mindedness. Especially quoting Pope Francis, he all said, in the 2014-15 document itself, I am counting on you to wake up the world. People are counting on us to wake up. So first of all, we need to wake up and we need to wake up the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Lazar, for sharing with us 10 challenges they are really challenging <laughs> thank you very much and these challenges leads us lead us to be more aware of the complexity of the reality we are living in right now that is completely different from the past even though when we speak about climate change, we say, okay, we had other era like that. But this is a special time for the possibility also in terms of digital communication, dig new technologies, you know. So um, I'm, sh I'm aware that all what we have listened during this sharing, we, we know. We know everything, what you said. But it's so important to have these meetings to nurture 
this awareness within us. So that's why, you know, we are not saying news. We are just wake up something that it's, and sometimes also in religious life, we are so busy that we risk to forget the essence. Now I would like to ask you, while I invite the people who are online, if they want to give, have, if they have questions, if they have comments, sharings, you can write the comments and questions on the chat session, or you can ask the flow. Sister Florence will help us to be connected in this world where everything is connected. So in the meantime, I would like just to ask you to briefly react to the reflection of the other. So Sister Georgian, what struck you most about uh, Father Lazar reflection and Father Lazar, can you give us some elements of what struck you most about Sister Georgian reflection? Very brief. <laughs> well, I totally agree with everything Father Lazar has said. And I think that um, the dynamic of intergentes, cum gentibus, the intercultural realities, interculturation that is absolutely necessary for the missionary today to be engaged in the life of the people, not just engaged with the people. For me, the whole of mission is about relationships. It's first discovered, we discover it in the relationship of the Trinity. That's the relationship for me that is primary, the relationship of communion. And I think it's out of the Trinity, the model of the Trinity, that we are called as missionaries to enter into the lives of the people, to really empty ourselves as, you know, we hear in Philippians, Jesus emptied himself, totally emptied himself. We are called to do that as well. And I think the challenges that Father Lazar mentioned are huge for us in a world today that is fraught with so many of these concerns, the concern of uh, the violence, the violence, which I think is it's an increasing reality with terrorism. We've lived violence before in the past, of course, but the reality facing us today, I think is even closer. It's um, closer to home. And it affects the missionaries in a very concrete way in so many places. The need for solidarity to really not just be in solidarity with that we work on a project or we work hand in hand about something, but that we actually enter into solidarity in the lives of people. I think that is a great challenge. And um, I think if we do that, our lives will be truly prophetic. I think it, uh, it's what the missionary is called to be. And I feel that it's what the church is expecting of us. The mission is near and far. The gentes are everywhere. It's no longer geographical that we're talking about. So I think it's how do we respond with awareness today, entering into the places where uh, the brokenness is most apparent. How do we do that? willing to give our life away if necessary. I liked your challenge about how many martyrs do we have? And I think of uh, our own struggle with being in places where having to leave countries where genocide was taking place and or wars being asked to leave actually by a bishop. If you stay here, you will be endangering the lives of the people because they will protect you. It's a real challenge for the missionaries today. How who want to stay and really be with and walk with, and if necessary, die with the people. So um, I think all of what you have posed, it's, it's very apt and very good for more reflection on how we go today, how we are today. It's not going to another place. It's how we are in communion with. I think for me, that's the word communion which sums up much of what you have shared, and I thank you for that. I'd just like to say 
just one other thing I think is, um, is the call of the missionary to, if we really carry the gospel, the gospel must challenge our customs. It challenges cultures and, and customs. And that's a very delicate, very delicate situation, very delicate thing to do. And uh, knowing you are a very large congregation, we are a very small congregation comparatively, but we have women from 44 uh, countries and cultures. And living in the countries and cultures of our sisters where the gospel truly challenges all of us, in my culture, the gospel challenges unjust structures, unjust customs. It's, it's a real uh, call to us how to do that well, how to do it with the gospel, how to allow the gospel to confront us. And I, I thank you for bringing that in because I think it's a very important point. Thank you. Sister, I appreciate what you shared from your own uh, congregational perspective and uh, how your congregation had really started um, to go as a mission agendas or indigenous mission in today's world. More particularly, how you really worked among the women, uh, women, and then bringing about empowerment. Along with that, you also acknowledged it is important in today's contest to work with the other congregations because to work against poverty or work against you know sufferings it, it is not easy that only one congregation works you know so it is important to really acknowledge there are so much resources available in other congregations and other ngos but we need to really work work with them also, you tr try to brought in a lot of experiences from your own self that we should be at the service of the evangelization. So we are only as servants, not masters, as even, you know, uh, Oscar Romero had clearly pointed out at that time. Also, you clearly also said today, of course, there are many images one can bring as missionaries, but one of the images what you brought today is that we need to be guests, you know, not we are going as guests to receive whatever people give and also learn what the people are. And in that particular interactions, you try to establish relationship. So therefore today, if I can say mission is relationship. Yeah, mm -hmm. along with that, I just want to add today whatever I have said also in my presentations regarding unjust customs, uh, working for solidarity and so forth. Today, mission also is to organize. Mission is to organize. If uh, as missionaries, if we do not know how to organize people, how to organize ourselves, then we fail in the mission. Okay. If we know how to organize the people, how to organize the community, that is the first step to share, to share the love, and then bring forth many other changes and transformation. So normally when I say, I normally say this, today mission is organize. Every missionary should know how to organize oneself, how to organize people, how to organize the community, and how to organize the society. Thank you. very much your reflections are really inspiring also to me and many words are coming up like a brainstorming in my mind while I was listening to you I would say key words for mission right now prophetic dialogue relationships I don't know, Florence, if we have some comments. No, we don't have from comments from online. So I have, would like just before we are going to the conclusion, I would like just to ask you, I mean, another question to both of you. The microphone. Um, it seems to me that one of the changes uh, that this synod is asking, or actually the indigenous people is asking a change in the evangel evangelization process, is that through mission, we have to empower the people to take over their life and not to talk on their behalf. 
I grown up with this lemma. We can uh, give the voice to the voiceless. I think that now we have to change now. I mean, it's time to do it, you know. What do you mean? What, in your experience, what it means that through mission we can empower people in this reality today? First of all, empowerment is actually a process. Uh, we need to, first of all, as I said, we need to organize people in the organization to be try to give the meaning of empowerment and then try to see how they can take on their own lives. I can give you a very simple example, then from that we could understand. One of our missions where I was working, one of the organizations with whom we were working, uh, that was a women organization uh, with the sisters who were leading them. They were going to the villages every day evening to empower the women, especially against alcoholism, because the men were drinking every day in the evening and they were creating a lot of havocs. Through that, the families were destroyed and many other problems. So how to really empower the women to stop this? And they really empowered them in your way to, to have courage. And then one evening, they went around the whole village with a stick in their hand, breaking all the bottles, all the alcohol bottles, and then threatening them. Then in the process, actually we need to understand also how this particular alcoholism spreads and so forth. That particular process, of course, there will be a lot of protest from the men because the women were very strong and they really spoke, especially using their voting rights. They challenged the municipal commissioner or the municipal representative in that village. We will not vote for you if you are not supporting our cause to abolish alcoholism in this village. So what I want to say is here, empowerment is not just to only talking, discussing and so forth, but you give the people what action they need to take. Certainly not violent action, not killing people, not beating, certainly not, it's very clear. But then certain actions which will really prevent the particular thing to happen. So they had really, they, they were convinced and if they stand together, they said they will succeed. And they succeeded in that particular village. Therefore, today, as we go to different places, empowerment is a process. First of all, we needed to win over the confidence of the local people. And these local people whom I am talking, they, were, they are not Christians. They were people of other religions. Therefore, win the confidence of the people and then try to tell them what are the realities and how they can really assert their rights and prevent something which is not wanted in the society. Okay. I think that um, empowerment comes with a long process and it comes with walking beside and with the people, getting to know them, not just taking or giving things to them that does not empower people necessarily. Uh, I remember many years ago, I was, I was missioned to Jamaica for one year at the time of my profession and I stayed for almost 25. And in that time, I remember when I left, I spoke to many groups of people who were farewelling me and I told them that I came as a very young child, <laughs> as a missionary, but they taught me what it meant to be a missionary, to work with the people, and they formed me. And what I learned over the years was that by working alongside of the people and being willing to share the gifts I had and receive from them, we were empowering each other. I spent quite a few years in lay formation, church lay formation, and 
at a time when there was a crisis in our diocese and the people demanded that the bishop come and they spoke to him about what they were not happy about in their pastoral situation and that it had to change. One of them stood up and said, you know, Bishop, this is your fault and your team's fault that I was part of because you taught us what it meant to be church and now we are going to take our responsibility. <laughs> it was a really powerful moment. It was not aggressive. It was simply a moment of claiming we are the church too. We are the body of Christ, not just the priests, the bishops, the religious. We have to take ownership of being Christ's body here. And so for me, it taught me that when you walk beside people and you really want, you really desire that they have their voice, it can be challenging when the voice comes out and when they speak up and speak out, but it's also life-giving. So I, I have seen that many times in my own life over the years, that people become empowered when you trust them. And when they find their voice, they have a voice, but they need the capacity to speak that voice. And when they know they are trusted, they can, they do, and some transformation happens. And we, I, as Father Lazar talked about getting involved in, in places where it's not just our own schools or our own dispensaries. For years, our sisters worked in government, government clinics, they worked in government hospitals, taught in government schools, and it's a, it is a special call to, in a very humble way, you talk about organization, you need to be organized, being willing to step back, take a back, a back uh, position, a back room position, but quietly bringing some skills of organization, bringing some skills of uh, knowing what, what might help to better the, the people's lives and eventually people embracing it and owning it for themselves and not knowing where they got it from. That's, that's really the quiet, discreet, not imposing way. And I think we do empower people in that way. I, I see the ways our, our women have empowered people, working with Muslims, Hindus in Bangladesh, in many other countries. And um, we do it walking side by side, not imposing. And I think that's the grace is when they take responsibility and we just step back or step out of the picture. Yeah. Thank you, Georgian. And that reflection recalls me what you have said before about to be guest and not host. So to make space in a way. Florence told me three questions. So Florence, can you read them? Yes, we have some question. Uh, what does father mean by organize? Can he articulate concretely? And then for Sister Mary, um, for Sister, how do you organize formation to prepare new missionary in your congregation? Yeah, thank you very much for this particular question. I would like to say organizing in the sense, uh, become a leader. And when we become a leader, in the sense we try to organize people. First of all, organize ourselves. We should know our mission, our orientation, our commitment, and at the same time what direction we are going. And the second one is to organize the people. Now, when we want to, when we organize the people, then we can see how to really challenge the unjust customs. I, as a person, as a missionary from another country or another place, it is not, it is very difficult to challenge the unjust custom in a local place because those traditions were incurrent for many years. So if I want to really change, that change can take place only by organizing the local people. They need to be empowered. They need to know the gospel values. 
but once they understand and then see that there are values in this there are some other you know good roses in the other side of the garden then certainly people will see positively and only by organizing the people once not it is not only to convince one person not one family it is number of people in your community once they are convinced then we know that they can change the unjust customs that's what i mean by what you call organizing we need to know we need to know how to get them together we need to see in what way that we all the people will be able to agree on there are steps you know slowly slowly but if we really remain within ourselves so introvert and we are so afraid are so fearful and we then we don't go out not we going out maybe just to to talk to discuss and then just to eat or you know share meals with them these are all good things it's good but then we need to do much further that's what i mean organizing organizing the people especially the things like challenging unjust customs the same thing solidarity i said now how can we make people you know uh, the solidarity among themselves it is not only solidarity of myself with them that we understand we all of us know this but then i am talking about solidarity among the people but solidarity among the people will not come just my talking alone i need a different spectrum of ways to really organize so that at least 100 people 200 2000 or even 50 people can really see our vision the right thinking what are their rights what are their what you, how they can defend their rights and then create leaders among them and those leaders will really assert their own rights in the future this is what if we don't enter into this process our mission can be good but i would say it will not be very good if we want to be effective and efficient then we need to really organize people at least we should have the talent or certain mechanism to really organize people that's that's what i mean organizing people can you read again the question for the sister in english and the question in french uh, no la question Like the first, it was a question, the question in English. Mm -hmm. But the, the third question in English was for Sister Georgian about the formation of sisters. Yes. yes. Can you read it again? We How do you organize formation to prepare new missionary in your congregation? Before she answers, could you please read also the question in French because then we have to close. The question is French. I will send the French. Uh, Est-ce que vous pouvez poser votre oh, question, Michel. Michel? Can you please ask your question? So Michel is online. We're asking her. Michel is online. So Michelle is online. She's going to ask her question. We're waiting for her. I'm going to read her question because maybe her microphone is not working. Jesus 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 has a predilection for the poor the, the countries of mission are the poor countries 
what is okay so what are the needs of the people who are not poor financially poor for evangelization today isn't it a challenge to meet those who have everything and know God and have the possibility, the ability to change the world? Because it's also important to use our resources in front of those, uh, in front of those who have the power. So, so basically, is it only necessary to evangelize in poor countries? Isn't it also necessary to evangelize in rich countries with rich people who can make a difference with their resources? That's the core of the question. So, uh, on va, on va... in terms of formation, um, our congregation has had multiple formation centers, as most congregations have over the years, but with a, a diminishment, in a sense, of numbers and looking to how we can best form women for mission today, we've made the decision to have one novitiate, one international novitiate, where women from whatever country they're joining us from will participate in the formation process. Our two languages in the congregation, official languages, are English and French, and so the formator must have a working knowledge of both English and French, and the novices are expected to have a working knowledge to be truly, truly, truly competent in one language, but to have a very good working knowledge of the other language. So that communication can take part, can take place in the division formation. Uh, I think today it's a, a challenge to do formation, but I think also the key elements of who we are and our charism show the way that formation will be done. We want it to be done in an intercultural context, forming intercultural community from the very beginning of the lives of these women who are preparing to become missionaries with, through the prism of being part of the Marist family, part of the Society of Mary with the Marist charism and the uh, being consecrated women. So the way we are doing it at the moment is that we are opening a new international novitiate and um, we are willing to take the risk of that and to see and evaluate it in the next few years. We want to have it in a country where resources are available. Resources, external resources, resources for uh, the formation process, but also internal resources of our sisters who have lived the missionary life for many years and can be, can be part of that process in sharing their stories and, and encouraging, encouraging by their very presence and lives and continuing engagement in mission where they are, mission every day, whether they're ill or aged or engaged in, in missionary, um, activity outside or inside the congregation. So we're trying to see a holistic, a holistic formation. And I think every congregation today is, is struggling with this, is really trying to meet this challenge of what is best in the formation process for new missionaries, new missionaries who are religious, who will be sent out beyond their own culture, beyond their customs, beyond their countries. And this begins in the formation process. So that's, that's really, I don't know about. Thank you very much Ra, for asking this particular question uh, regarding the mission among the rich or mission among the developed countries. It is not only mission among the poor. As I said, only I'm giving 10 challenges 
which I see important now, there are certainly many more challenges. Certainly I do agree that is, there is a mission among the rich. There is a mission to the developed countries. We know very well in our discussions that uh, Europe is a mission country uh, to, due to various things. We are very much aware of it. But then we, are, we need to focus in different perspective and different, different ways. So the challenges to work in the developed countries will be little different, a uh, little different. Certainly there are challenges, certainly. Number of challenges, plenty of challenges, I would say. But then the approaches we need to see quite differently. One of the things uh, when we try to analyze, especially mission in Europe, we also have to see the different underlying problems or concerns. There are many Christians here, they belong to Christ, but they don't want to belong to the church, right? So the problem is not about the concept of mission, but it is a problem of how they are connected with the church. So that is one of the things. The other one is more of a globalization and uh, secularized. So they don't try to see the value of God, value of the divine in their lives or in the society. One of the other concern is about sometimes they don't like to see the poor. They don't want the poor. So many different analysis we have to do before understanding what is mission in Europe. But in that particular context, one of the thing is that as missionaries, what we can do as missionaries, as uh, intercultural communities, we can have this countercultural community, a countercultural way of doing mission. That is one of the ways. The other one is certainly we need to address these people, uh, those who belong to the church, but, uh, and also those who don't belong to the church, importance of community because community is important. And only in living in a community, it is because of highly individualized society uh, in developed countries, they don't see the value of community. So here, the value of community is also is important. The other aspect is they also need to see the people around, you know, the poor. So therefore, we also have to touch them to really give the sight of what is the meaning of the people who are living in the society with the poor, with the poverty, with the homelessness, and the people who are migrants, refugees, and so forth. So it is not only taking care of them, but also we need to also address the issues among the people, among the people who have got money and who have got other resources that they have to see the value of Christ because this particular value, they will be able to perceive the meaning of humanity, the meaning of a human person, the meaning of the gospel and the meaning of the church, meaning of Christ. Once they understand the meaning of Christ, slowly all the hardness in the heart will slowly melt away. It will take time, but then it will melt away. And as missionaries, we need to work towards this, how to really melt down the hardness, the hardness among the people who don't want to see the poor, who don't want to see the other people's suffering. Certainly, we have the mission among the rich. Thank you. Thank you very much for for the questions that inspire other reflection on this issue. I have the impression, I have the feeling that the call for all of us, baptized, sent, is to be healers of the wounds at different level, personal, communitarian, familiar, society, cosmo, earth and also to be able to be open to take care of life 
in all its forms. So thank you, we are going to close. Thank you very much, Georgian and Lazar, to share with us. And really, it was really inspiring. We will continue. Uh, Florence, can I have the presentation? Thank you. Because we want to share with you other good news because we are planning other meetings before the end of October. We have also others for November, but these are specifically for and about the Synod. The two events that will be online, it's Thursday 24 with the prayer online for the Synod, Religious Sisters Connecting Worldwide. It will be just online in English and in Spanish. We had already one that was October the 8th, so at the beginning of the Synod to pray from the Synod. And the other event we are very proud of is the next Monday at 3 p.m. here at DOSG or online in five languages, Spanish, Portuguese, English, French, and Italian, listening to our, to the sisters who have been participating in the synod, the synod. So we will listen their voice. We hope to also have the final document approved by the Pope. So uh, it will be like a follow-up meeting on the synod, listening to us. Okay, thank you very much. We can have our, okay. I think we can close. Thank you. Thank you again for participating. Thank you for our sister who by mistake came here to participate. You're very welcome. And thank you again, Georgian and Lazar. <laughs>